Hope that you're well. Uh, I think today uh, is one of those days that you'll look back on and see as so much more than just uh, a godly man coming to tell you about a project that he's working on or an opportunity for you to visit something that I think the whole world is going to want to see. I, I think today you're going to connect with this reality that um, when God gives you resources, when God gives you an opportunity to leverage your life for kingdom advancement, and you begin to do it in small things, and you're faithful in those small things, then He tees you up for bigger and bigger opportunities to do things that you've never been able to do before. I don't know about you, but uh, I am so thankful to the Lord for His Word, the Word of God, the lamp unto our feet. The Bible says about itself, right? that the Word of God is living and it's active and is sharper than any two-edged sword and cuts through bone and marrow and judges the attitudes of life. I don't know about you, but every day I look to the Word of God to show me who I am as a mirror. I look to the Word of God to to light my path in life, and I I, I look to the Word of God to tell me truth in a world full of lies. And and today, honestly, is one of those days where a brother in Christ is going to come tell you about how that the Word of God can be on display to point people to the God of that Word. And I can't wait for you to be a part of that. A couple quick announcements before we uh, hear more about that. Uh, with the LU Sur Fair it is uh, almost wrapped up. Today's your last chance to go and find out about all the CSER opportunities with the fair. Uh, then don't forget, obviously, Saturday we've got the big game, right, coming up, the football game. We want to go support the Flames. Excited about that. Uh, be praying, continue to be praying for, uh, you know, just Hurricane Irma. Just know this, we already have contacted people down there. We, we are already have looking at ways that we can find um, servant opportunities. We're going to go, all right? We know we're going to go. We'll probably send multiple groups there. Uh, but at this moment, uh, what they're asking for more than anything else is prayer. And so as soon as that gets settled enough where Samaritan's Purse can be the boots on the ground, we're going with them. I promise you that. We don't ever not go to those kind of things. But be patient with us as we wait uh, to get our marching orders. I want to show you a video real quick, but before I do that, I do want to recognize somebody real quick that I think President Falwell will give you a little more about. Uh, the Rawlings brothers are in the house today. Uh, they are a- incredible donors to our school, partners of Liberty University, Herb and George. Can, can we just welcome them into the house just for a second? So honored to have you. Um, The reason I'm stealing a little bit of President Falwell's thunder in recognizing them real quick is that Herb Rawlings celebrated this week his 85th birthday, ladies and gentlemen, 85th birthday. And we're bringing out a cake with 85 candles on it. And John Luke, John Luke has a uh, fire extinguisher because every time, anytime there's 85 candles, things could get set on fire. There's so many that it's melting the cake. It's his breath in your lungs, sir. (laughs) Real, real quick, come on. Let's do this 10,000 strong. Happy birthday. And many more, sir. We love you. Thanks for all you do for the kingdom. Thanks for all you do for just the the glory of God. Hey, let's watch this video real quick, and then President Falwell will come up and introduce our guest. Let's watch this video. Hey, Liberty students, Pastor David here in Washington, D.C., in what right now is a hard hat construction zone, but soon to be opened up in mid-November, as simply put, the Museum of the Bible. I can't wait to bring you here in person and show you how this place is going to impact millions of people. This is a place where the Word of God will be on display. I think as Christians we'll come here and be inspired and affirmed in our faith. But I think even lost people, even people who don't share our faith will come here and see the positive impact of God's Word in this world today. We've set up special experiences for you as a Liberty student, experiences that are not going to be afforded to anyone else, and I can't wait for you and I to come and walk these halls together.
Good morning. How about that Baylor win? Can you believe it? I had more fun down in Waco this weekend than I've had in a long time. It was just, they, they were so gracious and kind to us. I felt a little bit bad for beating them, but not really. It's, it was, it was uh, quite an experience. So proud of our guys, and it's just going to launch our program to a, a new level, and, and uh, it's going to be great for Liberty University. That's the only contact a lot of people ever have with your university is through sports, and so it's, it's so important to have that window to the world to, to show what our mission, our Christian mission is all about. So thank you for supporting. Thank you for staying up till four o'clock in the morning. And uh, even though the plane couldn't land, but it was, uh, but you got a day off of school, right? So what? <laughs> We've got some very, 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 very special guests with us today. I am. Um, I've been working with my brother trying to get him home, but the airport's still closed, and there's no way to, uh, he's just stuck in a shelter, so he's, he's just rolling up his sleeves and helping any way he can with uh, all the devastation. And um, I don't know why he went to the Caribbean in August or September. I, I'm gonna have to have a talk with him about that. It's just common sense, you don't do that. But, but, uh, but I shouldn't have said that, but I will. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm working, trying my best to get him home, and, and we've been, my wife, and Becky, has been in constant contact with Sherry, and, and uh, I really am thrilled to have George and Herb with us today, Rawlings. Herb was my dad's roommate at ba Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, back in the 50s, and Herb's dad and George's dad was the president of Baptist Bible College when my dad was a student there, and he was on our board until he um, passed away, I think, at age 90, 99, right. And he, but the interesting part of that story is that um, his wife died when he, when he was in his 80s. He remarried when he was 94 to an 88-year-old. And I'm gonna have to, t George, I gotta tell the story. He fell out of bed on his honeymoon night and broke his leg. <laughs> I don't know what possess I don't know what possessed me to tell that, but but George, but George and Her Herb, they they um, George has has got a subrogation law firm that in Louisville that he um, that he started, and it it does. Uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in claims every year. He's been a huge donor to, uh, to Liberty. The, 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 the new tower is, um, he's given 10 million towards it already. And I think he might have a check with him today, do you? Okay, he's got, he's got two million more for us today, right? <laughs> And Herb runs the foundation that operates ca Christian camps all over the world, one in Belgium, one in the Dominican Republic. I think one of the professional baseball teams uses one of their camps for their, for their uh, winter practice. And it's, there's beautiful camps all over the world. If any of you ever want to get involved in helping them in that ministry, I think they, they would welcome your, welcome your assistance. And, we just love the Rawlings family, appreciate them so much, and, and uh, they've been such an important part of making Liberty what it is today. But another family that's been so important to Liberty's um, growth and success is the Green family that owns the Hobby Lobby retail chain. Um, David, this 2003, we had, I was general counsel back at Liberty back then. We had signed a contract to buy the, uh, the what was an Ericsson cell phone plant right next door here for $10 million. And my father had flown out to Oklahoma to thank Mr. Green, to, to thank Mr. Green for, he had offered to give us a, 
Uh, they, they've given hundreds of millions of dollars worth of properties to Christian ministries and universities over the years. But there was one in Illinois that they'd offered to donate to us. We, we really didn't have any use for it, so we recommended that it be given to James McDonald, who's a good friend. He's a pastor in Illinois. And, that's, and so Dad was out there meeting with the Greens about that and happened to mention that we were about to buy this cell phone factory for Liberty's growth. And a million square feet, it's the Green Hall now. And within an hour or two after Dad left, I started getting calls from the Greens attorney saying, what can we do to buy it and donate it to Liberty? And so Erickson had already signed the contract, they were ready to close. I was able to talk them into waiting a month or two until the, the Greens could come in and buy it. They did it, they donated it to us, and that's one of the reasons Green Hall is one of the reasons why Liberty's been able to grow so much so fast. So the Green family has meant so much to Liberty, and what they're doing now in Washington, D.C. With the, with the Museum of the Bible, they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on that program, on the um, construction, and who knows, it, the, the, the collection of Bible artifacts is invaluable. It's just unbelievable. It's only three hours from here, so I hope all of you will, will go visit soon. But before Steve Green comes and speaks, I'd like to show a video about his efforts. Thanks.
Thank you. Good morning, Liberty. It's, uh, it's uh, great to be back on the campus. It's been several years since I've been here. Uh, my wife is with me. Uh, over here, there she is. Uh, Jackie. I have to say, we are a bit conflicted, though. Um, I have a daughter that got a master's degree from, should I say it? Baylor. Uh, I have another daughter, though, that received a master's here at Liberty. Uh, I guess I'll let you decide who might have had the wiser choice, but um, we, we are excited to be here at Liberty and love uh, uh, what the Fall fa Falwell family has done and uh, the impact that uh, this university has had on our uh, nation and on our world. Uh, so. Uh, it, it is an honor for me to be here to, to share this project that I'm going to primarily focus on today, the museum that we're building in Washington, D.C. It's been a journey that 10 years ago would never imagine being on, but uh, we just feel like God is up to something and we get to be a part of it. Um, we, we started this, uh, 501c3 was started in 2010 um, when uh, the Museum of the Bible was officially launched and uh, we got uh, started. Uh, so. Uh, this, this journey has been over the last seven years uh, and going to share with you a little bit of that, that journey and uh, what all has been transpired and just kind of give you a summary of what all we've got going on. Our real mission, our purpose for a museum is to invite all people to engage with the Bible. Uh, this is a book for all people. It is a book that has impacted people from all different walks of life and all different nationalities, uh, races, gender. Uh, and so... Uh, this book is for all, and we, our desire is to invite all people to engage with it. We probably know this book less than we ever have in this nation because we don't teach it as we once did. And uh, we want to inspire people to open it up. Our survey showed over 90% of the homes in this country have a Bible in their home, but uh, we're just not engaging with it. So ultimately what we want to do is in, invite people to engage with it. There's four different initiatives that have really developed over the time period that uh, uh, over those last seven years. The museum is one of those, but then we have research, our traveling exhibits, uh, and education are the other initiatives. And I'm going to kind of highlight and summarize each of those, uh, starting with research. As we were collecting items within our collection, we had a need to have items uh, uh, researched and we have engaged scholars around the country and around the world to do research on items that we have in our collection. One of those items is referred to as a Codex Climacia Rescriptus. Uh, I believe what you will see here are a couple of leaves from that particular document. Um, it was a, a document owned by one of the universities at Cambridge that uh, during the uh, uh, financial crisis uh, during 08 and 09, they uh, put it up for sale and we acquired it. It is called a rescriptus because it was rewritten on. And uh, with new scanning technology that's being developed at uh, Oxford, we can pull out that underlying text. This shot here shows the same leaf before and after some of those scans where the underlying text there on the right has, has popped out and the top text has disappeared and we can better understand uh, what that underlying text is. It is, most of it is scripture in an Aramaic language, uh, which would be the closest language to what Jesus would have spoken in his home. And so we're taking the scans from Oxford back to uh, scholars at Cambridge. Peter Williams at Tyndall House Cambridge is the one that's heading up the research uh, on this uh, particular document. And that is just an example of many of the research projects that we would have going on. Uh, another project we have is an archaeological dig uh, at Tel Shimron. Tel Shimron is a site in Israel, one of the largest unexcavated sites in Israel, about a 42-acre site, and uh, we started an exploratory digs last year. They just got a report this morning of some of the uh, results of some of the uh, excavation that they did this year. They're very excited about what they're finding. Um, we're excited about doing research because we're convinced what we will find, and that is that this book that we love and celebrate will continue to be validated by the evidence. So we want to turn over every rock we can and do as much research as we can, uh, and then be able to present some of those finds in uh, the museum there in D.C. So that's a bit on research. Education uh, is the next one that uh, I'll mention. In the year 2000, Life Magazine came out with a, ma a publication that had the 100 most important events and people of a millennium. The top 10 uh, are shown here. Uh, number 10 was The Compass Goes to Sea, uh, 9, Hitler Comes to Power. That's the one that makes me think that I don't know that 
important would be the best term. I don't know that I would call that important, but impactful, yes. That event impacted our world. So these are events that have impacted our world. The Declaration of Independence, Gunpowdered Weapons, Germ Theory, Galileo's Telescope, the Industrial Revolution, Luther Knox, Columbus's Voyages. These are events that had an impact on our world. But number one on that list was Gutenberg Prints the Bible. So for a millennium, what Life Magazine determined was the most impactful event for a millennium was Gutenberg printing the Bible. Notice it wasn't the Gutenberg Press, it was Gutenberg Prints the Bible. That changed our world. Does the average person on the street have a clue to the degree that that event or this book has had an impact on their life? I don't think we fully grasp the input, impact this book has had on our life. Uh, and so for us not to teach this book just doesn't make sense. Uh, we want to educate people on this book. Uh, we are engaging a company out of Israel that is adding an element to this, uh, the curriculum that we're developing called augmented reality. Uh, where it, it combines a textbook with a tablet where you can interact with the, um, uh, the device and can, as an example, you may have a picture of a temple uh, in the textbook. When you open the device and you open up an app that brings up the camera, put the camera over the text, there will, the, the picture shows up, there's a play button on the picture, you push the play button, now you get a fly through of the temple as opposed to just seeing a, a still picture. So that augmented reality is being added by a company in Israel. And while we were in, uh, a mayor was in this office of this company that was adding that element, um, he saw the curriculum and knew immediately that this would be very engaging for the students of his city. So he wanted to have the curriculum in this city in Israel called Ramont Gan, a suburb of Tel Aviv. So three years ago, we had 1,600 students in Israel going through the Bible curriculum that we were developing for the public schools here in the U.S. They're interested in primarily the Old Testament, and so we will take what we can get. And uh, 1,600 students three years ago were going through the curriculum. Last year, or two years ago, uh, that number went up to 6,000 students, and this year we have 100,000 students that uh, went through the curriculum the, the year that just finished. This year they're thinking maybe 200,000 students uh, in the public schools in Israel will be going through it. At the end of the school year, uh, the first year, the mayor wanted to do a Bible contest for those students going through the curriculum. Uh, we have a shot here of the uh, auditorium where about 700 students were there. The 12 finalists were on the stage. They had a Bible contest. The mayor is uh, there at the podium uh, addressing the audience, and uh, the winner of the contest uh, won a trip to the U.S., and they actually got to go to D.C. and uh, tour the uh, construction site at the time, and uh, they have been doing that ever since as well. So it's an exciting opportunity, and it's one of those where I just have sensed time and time again that this is not our project, this is something that God's up to that we get to be a part of. Uh, it, we were not thinking about curriculum in the public schools in Israel. Uh, we were developing one for the public schools here in the U.S. when the mayor called, and so it just felt like God was saying, I want you to take it to my kids in Israel first. And we said, okay, God, that sounds like the way you would do it. Let's take it to the Jew first and then we'll talk. So uh, that's what we have did and it's been exciting um, uh, seeing that uh, success there. Another project that we have going on in this education space is uh, trips to Israel that we call Passages, and a group from uh, Liberty have uh, gone on one of those trips where so far we have had uh, about 3,000 students, college students that uh, are going to Israel on a 10-day trip where they get to see the sights and the smells of Israel uh, where the book that we celebrate was written. Uh, you get to see the political sites, the economic sites, the biblical sites, and it really causes the Bible to come alive. And we're excited about being able to send thousands of students over uh, to Israel every year. So that's a bit of the education, and uh, the education is a, a, a way that we can take this book to the people, because there will be millions of people that will come to the museum in Washington, D.C., but there will be many more millions that will never make it to D.C. And so for us to be able to take this to the people uh, through the curriculum uh, is a way for us to have an impact on people uh, all over the country and all over the world. Um, the next one is similar, our traveling exhibits um, is a way for us to take this story on the road in essence. In 2010, as our collection was growing, uh, we wanted to start telling this book's story, but at that time we had no idea when or where the museum would be. So we decided that we would build a traveling exhibit in Oklahoma, opened in Oklahoma City, and we called it Passages. Uh, we have a shot that shows what it looked like when it was in Colorado Springs. It was about a 40,000 square foot space, and uh, maybe 
three, four hundred items that we had on display at the exhibit. And this particular exhibit traveled to six different cities around the U.S. It closed out in California in a city called Santa Clarita uh, uh, early last year as we started focusing on the museum in, in D.C. Um, this muse this uh, exhibit opened up opportunities for us to do some international exhibits. The first one that we did was at the Vatican in the year 2012. We called it Verbum Domini, which means Word of the Lord in Latin. We went back in 2014, and this is a shot of the exhibit that we call Verbum Domini II, uh, where we were there during the Lent season, and we had people from over 100 countries that came through uh, this particular exhibit. Now, when we were there in 2014, the Pope at that time, I'm sorry, in 2012, the Pope at that time was Pope Benedict. He made a trip to Cuba, and while he was in Cuba, he was talking to the leadership, the Catholic leadership there, and said, well, maybe this exhibit that he would wake up to and see across the plaza, maybe it would make its way to Cuba. Well, our rule is when the Pope plugs your exhibit, you check into it. So, we made a trip down to Cuba, and not thinking things would work out, but doors opened, and we just feel like God... Uh, allowed us to have our first exhibit in 2014 in the National Cathedral in Havana, uh, where that we were there for about 30 days and had about 30,000 people that went through that exhibit uh, in Havana. They wanted us to come back the next year to Cuba, uh, uh, it was actually a couple years later to Cuba, went to Santiago, Cuba, where we had a similar exhibit. Uh, and so we've been to Cuba twice uh, with an exhibit with a, a great response. Now, when we were there in 2012 in Havana at the National Cathedral, the opening night there was, a, there was a celebration where they were telling the Bible story through the arts, dance, and music, and orchestra. And it was the Protestant and the Catholic churches coming together to put that event on, and it was phenomenally done. It ended with a standing ovation to the Hallelujah Chorus, and that was in Havana, Cuba. Um, later, as I'm back home thinking about this one exhibit, it is an example of the power of the unity of this book. That exhibit was the Catholic and the Protestant churches coming together in, in Havana, in Cuba, and it took the American government's approval and the Cuban government's approval. What book besides this book could have been able to have brought together that exhibit? Um, it just, again, shows us time and time again how that God has been involved in, in what we have been doing. So that was in Cuba. We've also had an exhibit in uh, Jerusalem. It was called Book of Books. Uh, we were going to be there for six months or so, and it was going so well that we were there for a year from 2000, October 2013 to October 2014, celebrating the Jewish roots of Christianity. Uh, it was at the Bible Lands Museum, which was a suburb, uh, is next door to the uh, National Museum there in Jerusalem, and uh, to, to great success, and we were excited about uh, being able to be there. We've had an exhibit uh, this year celebrating the Reformation that started in Augsburg, Germany. Um, that moved to Wittenberg as well, uh, and again, the attendance was about twice what they had expected. Uh, so uh, the traveling exhibits are an opportunity for, again, for us to take this book on the road, telling this story. Uh, we have other opportunities that we're looking at, a uh, church in London that we may have a uh, long-term ability to do an exhibit there. Uh, I've had discussions of some Asian cities, uh, potentially doing some exhibits there. Uh, so the traveling exhibits are a way, again, for us to, to take this uh, story on the road. But the museum itself, <clears throat> the museum um, was, uh, is a 430,000 square foot museum uh, that is just a couple blocks from the Air and Space Museum, one of the most attended museums in the country, just a few blocks from the Capitol. Uh, one of the great things is there's a metro stop that comes up in the block where the entrance is, so you don't have to cross the street. And I understand that's the only museum in D.C. that uh, you can get to without having to cross the street from the metro. Um, the building was originally built in 1923 as a refrigerated warehouse. Um, uh, this shot shows what looks like there's a bridge going into the second floor of that building. There's a train track that goes behind the building that's elevated, and there was a spur from the train track that would go into the second floor of that building. So it would pull into the building, offload whatever the produce it had, and then back, at, back out. Now, the good news is this building is built sturdy. Uh, the bad news is this building is built sturdy, and we're trying to do a lot of renovation on this building. Um, it, we designated it historical, so there's limits on what we can do. Um, and it was expanded, uh, and then an office building was built uh, adjacent to that. We acquired the, b both buildings, and uh, we're excited about uh, it, it opening in November. There's three ways that we look at this book. 
Um, there are three primary floors within this museum. The Bible's history, its impact, and its narrative. Um, and so, uh, the, the fly-through kind of walked you through each of those. Um, the impact floor, though, the, the first one I'll take a look at, um, there is a large section that talks about the Bible in America. Um, this nation, while you can argue about our founders' faith, the principles that this nation was built on, our founders looked to the Bible uh, for its influence. The concept that all men are created equal, where did they get that? It's a biblical concept. Imagine if they had a different worldview. Um, they might not have come up with that because that is a concept that they got from the Bible. Uh, there's two biblical concepts right there, the fact that we're created and the fact that we're created equal in God's eyes. Those were biblical concepts, as well as many other principles that this nation was built on. So, the Bible in America shows how that uh, this book has had an impact on our nation. It shows the good and the ugly. Uh, this nation was not perfect, and it never will be perfect. Uh, but the, the principles that they built this nation on, uh, they, they sought from the Bible. So, there's that uh, section as well as many others. Then we have the Bible in the world. Uh, for example, literature. The Bible's impact on literature or science or governments or uh, art, literature, all these areas, the Bible's had an impact. And that's what this floor is designed to show. The Gutenberg Press. We have a replica of a Gutenberg Press. Nobody knows exactly what the Gutenberg Press looked like. but. Uh, we we uh, have a replica that's, that we can operate and show that. <clears throat> we also have in this floor a, a section that's called the Bible Now. And uh, this is a very uh, a dynamic space where that we're showing how that this book this is being engaged with right now. As an example, we're working with Version. Many of you probably have the Version Bible app on your phone. Um, we can show a world map where people are downloading this app right now all over the world. By the time we open, they will have about 300 million downloads of the Uversion app. And there are people constantly downloading the app onto their device, uh, and we can show a world map. We can also show another world map that shows people that are opening the app and engaging with this book right now. So the skeptic that comes in and thinks nobody's reading this book anymore can go to this uh, map and see that people are engaging with this book right now all over the world. There is no book like that. Um, and so, it's exciting to be able to share the story. We can have the most highlighted verse last month or last year or yesterday that would be shown. What is uh, the most highlighted verse in this country or in Europe or Asia or anywhere else? And uh, giving people some of the highlights right there uh, that, that people are highlighting uh, right now in, in that section. So, the Bible Now section is, is going to be an exciting space. Um, and then right next door to that in this um, impact floor, uh, probably what's going to be one of the favorite spaces, I believe, is going to be a flyboard theater. If you go to Disney in Florida or in California, there's a ride called Soarin' in Florida, or some of you know about it. <clears throat> or it's called California Dreamin', I think, in California, where you fly over California and you are seeing the sights, uh, and when you go over an orchard field, you get a scent of orange uh, that you, you're, you're, you smell. So what we will be doing is this is the next generation. Instead of sitting, you're standing. You're holding on, and I think you're leaning forward. And we will fly you through Washington, D.C., where you can see where Scripture is engraved on monuments around that city. It's about a four-minute ride, and um, at one point, you're, we skip you off the tidal basin, and you'll get mist uh, sprayed in your face. And um, as you come up to the Lincoln Memorial, Lincoln has the Gettysburg Address engraved on uh, the memorial there, which has got Scripture laced in it. As you're coming up to the Lincoln Memorial, Lincoln will stand up. And the background will turn into the Gettysburg battlefield, and you will smell the battlefield. And so, as we are flying you through, we take you to about 13 different sites in D.C. showing you Scripture all over that city. Uh, and then when you leave, we will give you an app. You can download an app or get a brochure, and we encourage you to go find those sites for yourself. Uh, so, this I think is going to be an exciting uh, uh, ride that people are going to want to come and, and ride. So, that's the impact floor, showing the Bible's impact uh, on our world. The next is the narrative floor. There are people walking the street that know nothing. They don't know 
any of the Bible story, they've never read any of it, so where do you start with a person that knows nothing about the Bible? We think a basic understanding of the narrative of this book is uh, a good place to start. We have three sections in this floor. Uh, the uh, Hebrew text, the Old Testament, is a walkthrough. It's the only timed portion of the museum. It's about a 45-minute walkthrough. You go to a room, you hear part of the story, you go to the next room. Uh, very engaging, creatively designed, uh, the design firm that uh, is, is doing this part has worked with Disney and uh, is very creative in the way they can tell this story. So that is the way that we deal with the, the Hebrew text. There is a New Testament theater where we're telling the New Testament. Uh, in about uh, just under 12 minutes, we're trying to cover the whole New Testament. So. Um, for those preachers in the room, uh, we, we like to say it can be done. 11 minutes, the whole New Testament. So um, it's a 210 degree surround screen uh, with, again, some new technology being developed where we're telling uh, the New Testament story. And then the third part of this uh, floor is a Nazareth that Jesus knew. Uh, we want you to feel like you are walking into Nazareth. There is a uh, uh, mikvah, a, a typical synagogue, a olive press, a carpenter shop. So we want you to feel like you are walking into Nazareth. On the left is the artist rendering. On the right of that shot was the uh, actual site. This is a couple of shots inside that uh, as of about a week ago um, where that uh, uh, you got the olive trees and uh, the, the about 14,000 rock that we had to create uh, to make it very authentic. Uh, and so, we'll have docents in costume that will help, uh, help set the stage of the environment during the day of Christ so that it helps make the teachings that Jesus taught uh, become uh, much more real and uh, understandable. I think the last shot we have there is of a synagogue. Uh, there's a um, uh, artist rendering there on the left, and that's what it actually looked like about, uh, again, a week ago or so ago there uh, on the right. Uh, and then the third way that we look, the history floor. Um, there's more manuscript evidence for this book, for the New Testament portion of this book, than all the major classical works combined. Uh, does the average person understand that? Uh, we just want to present the evidence for this book. We start with the archaeological evidence, the manuscript evidence, going into the print and even in the digital age showing the evidence for this book. We, we don't tell you this book is true. That is for our visitors to make their own decision. But the evidence for this book continues to show that the book has been accurate in what is recorded. And again, going back to why we're excited about uh, uh, being involved in research and, and showing more and more uh, evidences for that. Uh, we, we have a uh, replica of the great Isaiah scrolls. For, so there's a Dead Sea Scroll portion. Uh, we're working with the Israel Antiquity Authority. We anticipate that they will be able to bring uh, uh, parts of uh, their collection over and show. Uh, but uh, we have made a replica of the great Isaiah scroll. We've made it on vellum, and that will be uh, shown in this space. Uh, there's a Torah room where uh, we will have a, uh, several hundred Torah scrolls on display showing the uh, dedication that the Jewish people had and continue to have today to uh, continue to transmit this uh, scriptural portion uh, uh, down generation after generation. Uh, there's a section called um, the, what do we, it's called Illuminations, but it's a section where there is a effort for the Bible Society has come together for, for about six years. They've been meeting in the Dallas airport once a month to finalize the translation of the Bible into every language of the world. Roughly, there's about a third of the languages that are done, a third in progress, and a third that haven't even begun. And so they're trying to get their arms around what does it look like. And in this section, we will show a representation of every language, those that are done, those that are in process, and those that haven't even begun. They're strategizing with new computer technology that job can be done faster and at a better quality than what it has been done in the past. There is a target date of the year 2033 to have that job done. And as you continue to come back to this space in the museum, you will see that bookshelf being filled up. So that if the job gets done as the target in the 2033, in most of our lifetime, something that's never happened in the history of the world could happen. A book in every language of the world. 
And so this is a site where people can go to, and if they want to be a supporter of that effort, they can right there say, hey, I want to pay for a verse for a particular language, or a chapter, or a book, or I, they can do the whole uh, language if they uh, have the resources. So uh, we hope this will be a way of exciting people to get involved uh, in uh, part of the effort to finalize this job by the year 2033. There's also a demonstration lab in this, uh, on this floor showing uh, research like the multispectral imaging that we were showing with the Codex Climacter Rescriptus and other uh, research that uh, can be seen and, and people can come and, and watch what's going on right there. So those are the three ma main three spaces, the history, impact, and narrative. But then we have on top, as, as we're kind of going up the, the floors and in the building, there's other supporting functions that we have in this, bu this building. For example, the Israel Antiquity Authority on the fifth level, they will have their own space as well where they have two million artifacts. They can constantly be bringing uh, new items and showing new discoveries uh, as new discoveries are being made in that space. There's a scholarly lecture hall uh, where we have, I think, our first lecture starting at the end of November uh, that can be broadcast uh, around the world. And then there's this theater space, the theater space that you, you saw in that uh, fly through the, the video early, it shows that uh, what we have what's called indoor mapping. The, there on the left is what the, uh, the building will look like when it's done. On the right, again, is what it looked like just a few weeks ago. But with a click of a button, that can become, the walls will become our screen, and it can look like this. This is uh, using indoor mapping with about 14 projectors. The walls become our screen. And uh, we will be opening this theater uh, with a Broadway play called Amazing Grace, uh, which is the uh, John Newton story. If you've seen the movie Amazing Grace, which is a very well done movie, it's the William Wilberforce story, but the Broadway play is John Newton's story, the slave ship captain that uh, came to Christ and is the author of the uh, song Amazing Grace. So that's what we'll start out in this theater. And then as you go on up, we have uh, a uh, banquet hall, a gathering room where we're excited about just wearing this facility out, having events going on every night, uh, uh, celebrating this book in some way different, uh, whether it be American Bible Society or a uh, men's uh, business group or a women's event, just constantly seeing this uh, facility being uh, used regularly. There's the, the restaurant up on the top as well. We have some of the best caterers there in D.C. that we sent to Israel to learn about the foods of the Bible. Uh, this will be a restaurant serving uh, foods of the Bible, a uh, Mediterranean type of a, a restaurant. Uh, that is also where we have a uh, outdoor garden area where you can sit outdoor and enjoy uh, the, the, uh, when the weather's good at least, the, the sites out there and uh, celebrate the uh, plants and shrubs and trees of the Bible that will be uh, planted out there. And again, you saw a shot of that in, in the theater. So we're excited. It's going to be in 2000, uh, later this year, 2017, in November 17 of this year, where we will open. Uh, again, what is it, a three, three and a half hour drive up to D.C.? We are excited to uh, be a resource for liberty and uh, having students go there. We are interested in inviting, as we said, all people to come and uh, engage with this book. And one of the ways that we feel like we need to do that is be in the popular culture. And one of the things that we have done, and some of you may have seen some of our uh, commercials that we have, we have some 30 second commercials that have been airing on some of the uh, prime shows from ESPN to The Voice to Good Morning America. Uh, uh, the major shows, and uh, what I'd like to end with is a three-minute extended commercial uh, that will sh uh, show how this book has had an impact on lives uh, throughout history.
Steve, Jackie, thank you. Thank you for propping up the Word of God that props up the Word who is God. Man, can we just thank them again? Just so grateful for your <laughs> diligence. Praise God. You know, here at, um, here at Liberty University, we do not worship the Bible. We worship the God of the Bible. But it is hard to love Jesus, the Word made flesh, while you ignore the written Word that's given to us. And I am so grateful that this place will be a place where people will see in Scripture the gospel, the gospel. And I can't wait to hear in years to come about all the people who are going to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior through the museum of the Bible. We have for you, as Liberty students, experiences already set up. Our goal is to, uh, I told President Falwell a minute ago, our goal is to send a thousand students, and all he said was, uh, we can do a lot better than that. So we're going to do a lot better than that. And we have for you VIP experiences, we have for you the theater experience set up. Uh, all you need to do is uh, text BIBLE to uh, 24502. And we'll get you started on uh, you going in December to be a part of the grand opening, all right? But more than anything, be praying. Be praying that God will use this to point people to the God of the Bible. Be praying that God will use this to um, really bring the Word of God, all right, into people's lives in a way that it has never done in the past. Amen? We love you. God bless you. All right? We will see you next week. You're dismissed.